Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's just past 1pm, so we'll begin the showcase as more of our guests are joining us online. I'd like to let everyone know that we are recording the showcase and we do intend to share the link to those of you who would like to receive it as soon as it's available on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like to receive the recording, please let us know via the contact details in your Eventbrite email or via the contact details that we'll put up on the screen at the end of the showcase. Welcome to our guests from across Australia and around the globe. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters that we all meet across today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and future and respectfully appreciate that the lands and waters of Australia have always been and remain the custodial lands and waters of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which I stand today, the Ngunnawal peoples. It is upon their ancestral lands that Geoscience Australia is located. As we share our own knowledge, learning and research practices within Geoscience Australia, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and traditions of the Ngunnawal peoples. My name is Alicia. I'll be your moderator for today's showcase. For those of you who joined us at our previous showcase, it's wonderful to have you here with us again today. And it's great to see some familiar names on the screen, if not see your familiar faces. For those of you joining us for the first time, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our first online Digital Earth Australia Showcase of 2020. And despite not being able to welcome you to Geoscience Australia, it is wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to share our program updates with a much wider audience this time. So first, some housekeeping. Because we have so many people joining us here today, we will be muting all the participants so as not to interrupt the presenters. I ask you to please ensure that your microphone remains muted during the showcase. However, we do want this to be a chance for everyone to engage with us and ask questions following the presentations. But we do have quite a few registrations, which is why we will be taking questions via the Zoom chat window only. If you're not familiar with the chat window at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that looks like a speech bubble and has the word chat underneath it. Click on that to open up the chat and you can type your questions in there during the presentations. Um, and I'll read them out for the presenters to answer. Please note your questions and comments are visible to everyone here today. And if we don't get time to answer all the questions we receive, we'll endeavour to answer them in writing and circulate those following the showcase. So let's crack on. For this showcase, we have five speakers, three of which are guest speakers who will talk about the work we're undertaking with Australian industry and how we will go about planning and delivering the Digital Earth Australia program. Our first presentation is from our Digital Earth Australia Program Director, Trent Kershaw, who will talk to us about the DEA industry strategy and the DEA Labs program before introducing our next speaker. Thank you, Trent. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry, just uh, making sure I've got control. There we go, under control. Uh, yeah, look, I'll, I'll repeat what Alicia said and, and just say thank you all for taking the time uh, out of your day to come and, and uh, see what we've been up to. Uh, I personally won't take much of your time and a big part of that is actually I'm really, um, really excited. I'm really excited. Uh, is that a bit better, Belle? Excellent. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm really excited to hear Phil's um, uh, presentation up next. Um, but before I do, I do just want to want to set a little bit of context about Digital Earth Australia uh, and our our uh, our role uh, and our our activities that we're uh, undertaking with industry. Uh, so. Uh, Geoscience Australia's DEA uh, program has has been established uh, to to do a couple of things. One is to uh, transform the way in which uh, government uh, makes decisions through increased utilisation of uh, Earth observation data. Um, equally importantly, though, uh, we we have a very significant role in uh, driving the uptake uh, of this data uh, within industry to help. Um, to help to drive um, increases in, in uh, productivity efficiency across the intra entire Australian economy. Um, in order to do this, we've, uh, we've had um, some long-term partners through DEA and, and, and GA for a long time uh, before that as well, has, uh, has worked significantly with Frontier SI. Um, 
they've been a fantastic partner and, and they're always uh, driving us uh, to, to think bigger, think outside the box and, and above all, um, make sure that we are going out and we are consulting uh, and we are listening uh, to make sure that we're building the, the best, most impactful program that we possibly could for, um, for industry. Um, so in terms of, of, uh, of our work with, uh, with Frontier SI, um, we did a big piece of work that, uh, that um, we released in April uh, 2019, which was the industry strategy, which um, basically set out a, a, an overall plan for, for the areas in which we were going to focus uh, uh, trying to lift um, in order uh, in order to uh, ultimately um, accelerate the, the growth of um, the Earth observation um, sector uh, and and ultimately increase the productivity of, of particularly primary industries. Um, and in that, um, I, I'm not going to go through what's on the screen. Um, I've, uh, but I do encourage you to uh, to check it out. It's available on on the GA website and uh, and also on the Frontier SI website. Um, but there are these key areas of education awareness that we are um, we are really trying to drive, and a big part of the way in which we've tried to drive that. And and to be honest. As a program, uh, learn by doing, uh, by actually stopping and, and uh, working actively with with real Australian businesses uh, to uh, to get Earth observation data uh, out there um, has been the DEA Labs program. Uh, in simple terms, it is a a small uh, incubator uh, grants program where uh, where. GA uh, offered up um, small uh, seed funding, you know, uh, up to fifty thousand um, dollars for up to three businesses, um, and alongside that, um, you know, the offer of, of some support uh, and and provision of some of our internal expertise uh, to overcome some of the hurdles that people uh, very often face when they're trying to work with with um, this complex data. And so, in that, um, we. Um, we just sorry i'm just there we go <laughs> uh so so we put a call out last year uh for uh for proposals and we were very happy with uh with the number of proposals that that we uh did get uh through that process uh and there were three uh successful projects that we backed and i've put them on screen uh, at the moment uh, so um Phil will be uh, will be talking about SIBO Labs and the work that they've been doing in a moment. But uh, but the other other people uh, that we've been working with are, are data farming, uh, who have su successfully uh, developed a um, a map uh, of uh, paddock boundaries for the entire continent of Australia, which is a is a really really impressive feat. Um, and also we've been working with NGIS and Decipher uh, to try and uh, and integrate some of uh, DEA's products such as fractional cover uh, into some of their uh, workflows as well. So I want to want to make clear a couple of things. We, we are very open about uh, what we know and what we don't know uh, in DEA and what we are we are still actively trying to learn about and you will hear about this a bit later on from some of our other presenters um, is how to effectively engage uh, with you uh, p uh, the people in industry so um, I'll put a call out and just say please please do reach out please do get in touch we're very keen to talk to all of you um, and and to involve involve you in some of the work that we're doing and and uh, we do have active work underway um, in in terms of uh, some market research work that you will hear, hear about from ever a bit later on um, so yeah please do reach out and please do get involved if you if you think you might want to get involved and you don't really know how just reach out and say that and we'll uh, we, we want to talk to you so uh, so please um, please don't be shy uh, get in touch um, and uh, with that, I will uh, will just introduce uh, Phil Tickle, if my computer will cooperate with me. Um, so Phil is the uh, managing director of SIBO Labs. Uh, he's got a background in agriculture um, and over 30 years experience uh, in the uh, geospatial and remote sensing uh, fields. Uh, he's put, put these things to a, a whole range of things, both in the public and the private sector, um, to try and support Australia ultimately and Australian businesses uh, to better manage natural resources, um, agriculture, um, climate change, uh, all, of, all of these kinds of things. Uh, so he 
uh, is uh, going to show us some really cool stuff. I did have the pleasure of, of getting to see it already yesterday and I can't wait to see it again. So with that, uh, Phil, uh, over to you. Okay, thanks Trent, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, mate. Okay, all right. Look, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here today. It's actually interesting uh, that I've uh, sort of spoken in front of a few large audiences, but having 160 people down the other end of uh, Zoom is actually uh, quite intimidating. So we'll see how we go. Um, look, we've been really excited to uh, to be part of the um, the um, Digital Earth Australia um, Labs program um, over the last 12 months or so, um, and it's really been an opportunity for us to, as a business, to uh, to build on a range of R&D that we've been uh, um, working on, and to be able to accelerate that work into operational platforms. So I'll just uh, Axel, there. Obviously, uh, my uh, screen's not progressing there. Okay. All right, so I've hopefully got the screen moving here now. Yeah, so um, so we've um, as part of the C the uh, the the uh, DE Labs program, we've um, we've basically got to the point now where we can um, uh, implement a range of uh, algorithms across a very large catalogue of data that's uh, managed by uh, by DEA Labs and DEA, uh, and really drive um, the adoption of imagery, basically from the national to the paddock scale, and literally do it within a few minutes. Okay, so just a little bit about SIBO Labs before I before I sort of uh, move into uh, to um, uh, sort of what we've actually done. So SIBO Labs, we're a we're a, basically a, an agricultural data science business. We're focusing on um, application of remote sensing into agricultural um, systems and largely focusing on uh, the extensive grazing enterprises. So there's a lot of players in the precision agricultural cropping area, and uh, and we certainly uh, uh, made some conscious decisions to focus on uh, what makes up about uh, 60 to 70 percent of Australia's um, uh, land mass, which is basically private ownership uh, of um, of livestock operations, um, and to deliver services to those uh, to those um, to those grazing enterprises. Uh, but ultimately, we're a, we're a data science business uh, working directly with agricultural uh, agricultural uh, businesses. This is, I suppose, an example of some of the bread and butter that we're working on now. So this is commercial, a commercial business right now. Um, we basically deliver um, five daily estimates of pasture biomass directly to uh, individual producers. And we, at the moment, we're delivering services to about 20 million hectares um, uh, on a weekly basis. And we you can see a map here. This is a simple interface that we, uh, that we um, uh, push to, uh, to clients. Uh, at individual paddock level, we can estimate the, uh, the kilograms of dry matter in terms of pasture. Uh, in the paddock uh, and, uh, and we can basically deliver that on a five daily basis. Most importantly, we're doing that very much in collaboration with producers. And on that picture there on the, on the left hand side there, um, we've got, uh, got a family, basically this was a, a COVID class just in the last week or so, um, a, a family basically out at Roma, Echo Hills, um, uh, that have been out collecting uh, pasture data for us using, uh, using an app. Uh, that we provide to the producers, and then we use machine learning algorithms to uh, to derive uh, very uh, very accurate estimates of pasture biomass at individual paddock level. We then push that through to decision making. So you can see a map here. This is a traffic light report um, for an individual property. So it doesn't matter whether it's a thousand hectares or a million hectares. Every week they're getting an estimate of uh, kilograms per hectare, and also the total feed and offer in terms of uh, tons of dry matter uh, per paddock. And most importantly, we're then pushing that into other applications. So here's an example here where we're pushing that data directly to a uh, to a leading agricultural platform here in Australia, um, AgriWeb, um, where that information basically is in uh, is on the uh, mobile phones of uh, several thousand producers in Australia, and we're delivering the uh, the data uh, from our system directly to AgriWeb through uh, through API intelligent APIs. So that really is our core business, but. With the uh, some of the um, the uh, the barriers around adoption, we really wanted to start to look at how we could take that um, those capabilities further and uh, and really start to remove some of the barriers to uh, to large scale adoption adoption of um, this sort of imagery at um, at an individual property level. 
So in terms of the DEA labs collaboration, so as I mentioned earlier on, we're already delivering um, uh, pasture biomass estimates to a, to a very large number of producers over a very large area uh, on a weekly basis. But there's some real barriers to, uh, to how we then push that to, uh, to the, broader, the, you know, the broader businesses. We've got, um, we really need to look at how we increase throughput. We need to be able to uh, lower the onboarding overheads um, for individual producers. Uh, we obviously got, obviously got computing costs to worry about. And we also, in this world of machine learning, we really want to start to turn every property into a living laboratory. So how do we become far more um, uh, flexible in terms of the way we're building our models, uh, using the imagery and delivering those services to producers? We don't want to be on a three-year uh, three R&D cycle. We want to be on a three-day you know, three or a three-week or a three-month um, uh, R&D cycle for this, uh, for this sort of work. Um, and our goal is basically to be able to provide um, uh, weekly imagery to every single land manager in Australia, uh, our land holder. There's about 100,000 agricultural businesses. Um, the grazing industry that we're working with make up about 60 to 70 percent of Australia's land mass. Uh, and our goal is to be able to deliver, to scale and deliver that through uh, through to every every individual business that wants uh, wants imagery on demand. And we had a we had a um, a, a prototype working with uh, AWS Lambda serverless uh, platforms. A big shout out to AWS. In fact, they uh, they've been great in terms of um, providing the support through their startup program. So we've certainly acknowledged um, the uh, the efforts there. Um, so DEA Labs was an opportunity for us to take those prototypes that we developed and uh, and then really look at how we put that into um, into operations through some uh, some active co-funding and some collaboration with uh, uh, with uh, the uh, the DEA team. So I suppose just a bit of a snapshot. I suppose this is where most of us are today. When we're looking all used to looking at Google Earth, uh, and quite often for any individual past part of Australia, uh, the imagery is pretty static. If you're in New York, you probably get access to new imagery every week, uh, but in Australia, on any individual property, um, the imagery can be three and four uh, years old or more. So really, it's actually not suitable for uh, for any tactical decision making. So what we've done is actually gone um, to the, the really the next level. So we've now used these machine learning platforms that we can generate a mosaic of the whole of Australia basically in under a minute. Um, uh, using these serverless platforms, we're able to throw 3,000 CPUs or 3,000 individual processes in parallel at, at um, the DEA data catalogs. Uh, and uh, in this case here, we've then processed um, several thousand uh, Sentinel tiles and delivered a 16 day mosaic basically for the whole country, literally in, in a couple of minutes. We can then start to apply some uh, machine learning models to it. So in this case here, we're looking at a fractional cover model. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is processed on the fly. So um, just yesterday, I opened up um, uh, you know, QGIS, um, hit, the, hit the button, and basically within, the, within a minute or so, I basically had a map of Australia showing uh, fractional ground cover. In this case here, the red areas are dominated by bare ground, the green areas are photosynthetically active vegetation, and the blue areas are dry, uh, non-photosynthetic cover. Uh, and now we're pushing into um, some quite sophisticated biomass models. So I showed you earlier on our, uh, our, our uh, current biomass uh, process. What you're looking at here is still a little bit of a prototype, but um, we'll basically be delivering this um, operationally in the coming months, uh, delivering regionally specific uh, biomass uh, predictions uh, based on, on regionally specific models uh, on the fly and on demand. So what I wanted to do now is just quickly dive into just a minute of um, of uh, a bit of a bit of a, uh, a video. This, uh, there's a bit of a lag here in the screen. So this is just an example. This is a very light application that we're providing to um, to users uh, at the moment. If I just turn that on, um, we've got address searching. Um, so I'm just going to go to a place called Monto in central Queensland. Um, zoom into uh, into Monto. Uh, it's a mixed uh, farming and grazing area. And uh, just turn on Google, uh, the Google hybrid map here, so you can see here the area, mixture of sort of forest and, uh, and, and pasture areas. Now I'm going to hit the button on our 16-day on our, uh, median product, and literally within a couple of seconds, we have hit the DEA catalogs and processed that data, done the cloud masking and the corrections, and delivered a mosaic basically within, uh, within a few seconds. Now as I zoom in, what's happening now is that basically those parallel processes are actually continually hitting the, you know, the data catalog and processing, processing those pixels on a real time on a real time basis. So we're at the point now here. We're at full resolution. Uh, you can see individual trees. You can see a centre pivot. You can see some pasture areas and some cropping areas. 
Now what I'm going to do now is just turn on the fractional cover. So I'm um, looking at here now, we've got a 16 day mosaic. So this is basically as of yesterday over the last 16 days, the red areas are areas of bare ground, the blue areas are non-photosynthetic, in this case here pasture, and the uh, the green areas are photosynthetically active um, uh, crops or, uh, or, or trees in this particular case. But you can see the red areas there, There's, those are areas that are relatively low in ground cover at the moment. And we have a, a national um, uh, cadastral and property database. So we've got the ability to, uh, to identify specific properties um, and work with those property owners uh, delivering our services. We can also go longer time frames. So we're looking here at a ground cover product um, over the last five years. In this case here, the minimum ground cover. And we're looking at the minimum ground cover over the last five years. The white areas are 40 to 60% cover and the brown areas are, uh, are less than 40% cover. So we can go from very short time frames to very, uh, to very long time frames. And we can also look at um, uh, changes in woody vegetation. So here's the uh, Department of Environment um, uh, vegetation change data, and uh, we can do that basically uh, through time, um, basically for the last 30 years. So just stepping back here, we're back at the start here now. And uh, yeah, so we've basically gone from an image of the uh, entire nation to an image of uh, basically, let's click the next slide here, uh, down to an individual paddock, uh, basically literally within a, few, within a few seconds, under a minute. You can see here this uh, this paddock here is um, is uh, basically lucina trees. So I'll just step back here. Um, we're down at the paddock level here, and uh, you can see um, the detail in this sort of imagery uh, where you've got uh, those stripes in the image. There are actual lucina trees that are actually in, in an individual paddock. <coughs> Uh, we're also doing some very, uh, very uh, sophisticated um, uh, zonal statistics as well. So at an individual property level, we can uh, we can start to uh, generate statistics basically at a property level, and then use that information here to uh, uh, to provide uh, the producer with the ability to uh, to attach biomass levels uh, very rapidly to a histogram produced at an individual property level. So just to finish up, um, this has been a, a wonderful uh, example of basically how industry and uh, and uh, and um, uh, government and research organisations can work together. We wanted to fast track um, what uh, what we'd uh, already put in place. We've now got the ability to seamlessly uh, deliver imagery to every property in Australia, basically within minutes. Um, we're able to take that information and using our crowdsourcing approaches that I showed you, we're able to develop some very uh, complex predictive models based on crowdsourcing data. And most importantly, to then be able to drive that in near real time, basically to individual uh, um, uh, producers or farmers on, on ground. And also, most importantly, to be able to integrate that with other third party providers. So we as a business are trying to avoid building too many front ends. And this is providing an opportunity to, um, uh, to really drive this into uh, back end applications for a whole range of other businesses around Australia as well. It also means that we've now got a living laboratory. So uh, as I said, with the research cycle here doesn't have to be a three year research cycle. Um, we can really basically take information here, take information on ground, which is really what our core business is, and then drive that into some very, very rapidly developing predictive models to, uh, to deliver uh, management actions on, on ground or on farm. So um, there's also been an enormous um, a range of benefits that we're, uh, we're seeing in terms of costs as well. So um, just as one example, we've, uh, we've, we've seen a 99% reduction in our computing costs for some applications. So um, in terms of being able to scale up and deliver um, these serverless processes to properties, um, we're seeing you know, well over 90% reduction in our computing costs and obviously labor savings in, uh, in the ability to, to onboard clients very rapidly. So for us, this, this has been a game changer for our business. Um, we're uh, gradually rolling these services into our production system. Um, we're, uh, we're working with other businesses and very focused on business to business collaboration. And I think ultimately uh, at the end, the end game for us is actually delivering a, 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 a vibrant agricultural sector. So it's really going to open up access to, uh, to this, sort of, this sort of imagery and, and modeling capability to every, uh, every producer or every farmer in Australia. So I'll leave it there. So there's, there's one of our uh, there's one of our uh, our clients. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, uh, so we're certainly uh, wanting to collaborate, and uh, my you know, my contact details there on the bottom of the page. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Bill. That's fantastic. Um, we do have a question for you in the chat window from Liam. Is there a model for other analysts and organisations to use this platform? It's well, amazing, which it is. 
Yeah, so um, so certainly we're um, we're going to be um, sort of uh, providing uh, API based services here. So we're pushing these uh, capabilities out through uh, through our web map tile services um, and APIs. So we're certainly wanting to uh, work with other businesses to uh, to you know, implement these sorts of services in in behind uh, our their systems uh, and uh, and uh, work with other businesses to deliver clients to their uh, services to their clients. Thanks, Phil. Uh, we have a question that I'll ask Trent to answer. Um, we'd love to know how you engage with customers to ensure that the products um, that you develop are exactly what they want. Oh, thanks, Alicia. Uh, and uh, thank you to Galaxy A20 for the question as well. Um, so, uh, look, uh, I think we're going to hear a lot more uh, about this from uh, Eva in, in her talk, talking about what we're doing in terms of trying to, uh, to work through market research and better understand uh, how, in fact, uh, people are using um, satellite data to make better decisions, um, but equally how they're not and why they're not. So we are, we are um, in a... Uh, in a reality where uh, you know there is a there is a hell of a lot that can be done using satellite data, especially when it's brought together uh, with on-ground knowledge uh, and also other other uh, spatial and, and non-spatial data sets. So we're we're doing doing some work in terms of uh, user research and what have you. The reality is that there's an entire economy out there that um, that I see uh, a great opportunity for um, for the tech industry, for example, and um, uh, and uh, and other people, uh, businesses in Australia, uh, to help to bridge that gap that exists at the moment between uh, the data that we uh, have, and we know there are so many insights that can be drawn from it, uh, and and the actual end user who's making a better decision as a result of it. Thanks, Trent. Phil, we might have time for one more question for you. Um, can you estimate soil carbon? Uh, well, yeah, that's the holy grail, isn't it? Certainly, um, in terms of what we're doing around pasture biomass and ground cover, we've got surrogates for um, uh, 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 soil carbon potential, but um, there's obviously a lot of uh, work to go on in terms of ground calibration. But really, that's what, it, what our core business is, you know, collecting data very rapidly on the ground. Um, we've got methods to, to produce very, very... Um, um, uh, efficient uh, on-ground uh, stratifications um, and really opportunities there to to dramatically dramatically reduce our our sampling time on the ground and our sampling costs. So um, really, this is about um, you know, the remote sensing is not really worth much until you actually get on the ground. And uh, and really, the focus for us is actually to uh, to capture the right information on the ground at the right time and to use that to then drive the model development and the predictive capabilities. Thanks, Phil. Um, that's fantastic. I can see some more questions coming through the chat window. And um, just a, rem a reminder to everyone that we will be capturing those and attempting to answer them in writing and circulate them. But I do encourage anybody who's interested in talking to Phil to reach out to him uh, with the details on the screen at the moment. Just go for it, Phil. If you've got one, just, I just thought I'd just um, a question there in terms of accuracy. We're basically uh, achieving uh, uh, accuracies very similar to, uh, to uh, ground estimates of pasture biomass. So in southern pasture systems, we're regularly getting down to plus or minus a couple of hundred kilograms per hectare. Uh, and in the north, certainly to, uh, to within sort of uh, plus or minus sort of 500 kilograms. So they're pretty much the, that's the level of accuracy that you can achieve on with your on ground sampling. And it's actually always an estimate on the ground. We never have the truth on the ground, we have an estimate. And we're certainly uh, achieving similar levels of accuracy using the satellite data. Um, basically man management level decision accuracy. Thanks, Phil, that's great. Um, so without, Further ado, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, I'd like to welcome Phil Delaney from Frontier SI. He's the Chief Innovation and Delivery Officer. And Phil's going to talk to us about some of the important lessons we've learned from the DEA Labs program and what we can expect for the future. Welcome, Phil. Uh, thanks, hopefully you can hear me just fine. Um, so for those of you who don't know uh, us, so Frontier SI are a not-for-profit organisation who sit between government, academia and private industry to help bring ideas through to real-world products and services uh, in the domain of, of spatial technology. 
So we're a social enterprise who's really aiming to grow the size and impact of the space and spatial industries in Australia and New Zealand, uh, particularly focusing on the delivery of better government services uh, such as uh, DEA here. So GA, uh, Geoscience Australia have been a partner of ours for 17 years uh, and we've been involved with and investing in uh, the Digital Earth Australia program together uh, since the idea was first conceived a few years ago. Um, so Trent covered uh, the strategy earlier. So as he said, there are three areas of focus, uh, one around data and technology, um, one around education and one around awareness. These were all generated with, through consultation with over 500 people across the country uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and in order to achieve um, you know, growth through development in those focus areas, the program needed to be underpinned um, by uh, an industry labs program, which allowed uh, GA and industry to rapidly test ideas uh, in all of those areas of focus. Uh, with the aim of uh, accelerating the adoption of uh, Earth Observation and Digital Earth Australia uh, across Australia. So in order to test whether or not uh, DEA Labs was uh, you know, interesting to industry and a viable way to, to achieve those goals, uh, we released a, a call for uh, interested companies to be part of our first lab submission in about April of 2019. Uh, and we were pushing out only three quite small projects, so three $50,000 uh, grant opportunities at the time. We were pretty overwhelmed by the interest that we got and really struggled to narrow down uh, a, a range of really interesting ideas from 33 uh, you know, different collaborations. Uh, we were aiming for six in a short list. We couldn't quite get there. We could get to the top eight um, who submitted more detailed proposals to us. And from that, we, we, we picked the top three who uh, by a, a happy uh, accident were all themed in the uh, agricultural or ag tech area. We generated a, a quite a bit of um, focus and media um, at a, a ministerial level and at a general media level uh, through the program. And we were able to do things pretty quickly. So from uh, launching that the labs program existed through to getting the first uh, project activities, was only about a three month timeline. So in terms of what industry got, and uh, we're gonna talk here about the individual successful companies, but also about broader industry. Um, the, the successful companies got the resources, both financial and human, to change their business processes and to evaluate new technologies in order to better serve their customers. Uh, these individual companies also received significant opportunity for promotion, both through the ministerial and general press coverage, uh, but also more importantly, from supported attendances at, uh, at key conferences, events like this, but also targeted ag, ag tech conference, uh, conferences, where they're able to sit on the Geoscience Australia uh, desk and, and really raise the awareness of their work. But industry as a whole also got to benefit um, from the priorities that were set by uh, by the individual successful companies. So looking at things like the accelerated deployment of the whole archive of Sentinel-2 up onto, up onto AWS, uh, as well as the testing of uh, the hosting of some data products on the Google infrastructure. And finally, the, the rapid or accelerated deployment of new products, such as the Sentinel-2 version of the fractional cover product. Geoscience Australia also benefited from having this program. Um, particularly through the EOI uh, phase in being able to understand the state of the earth observation sector and the kinds of ideas that they're working uh, on and also to broaden um, their thinking on the kinds of applications that people have in mind for this kind of data and the problems that they want to solve with it. Uh, it was really great to see awareness driven out through agriculture and ag tech by having such a strongly themed set of successful companies here. Uh, and most importantly, GA really learned uh, new ways to work better um, with, with industry uh, on, uh, on projects together, uh, particularly for companies that got to co-locate co with GA for a period of time. And, and finally, um, we did have some lessons, obviously, that we learned and some recommendations. So the first is to provide clearer pathways to access DEA data um, by increasing um, the uh, data and products that are available on a, on a variety of cloud platforms. Um, to work uh, on continually making it easier to scale ideas. So we can test great things in things like the DEA sandbox, 
but having cleaner pathways to then go about scaling those solutions to a continent-wide level are, are needed. And we also got great lessons about uh, how we might improve future versions of DEA labs, such as mixing open calls with the fine challenge uh, that we might run in partnership with peak bodies in the agricultural, mining, or even planning sector, for example. Uh, so yeah, on the whole, it was a really uh, a great program to, to run. We think that the idea was really validated over the past few months. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Phil. That was fantastic. Um, we don't have any questions coming through the chat window, but if people would like to continue adding those, then we can come back to Phil later. But um, in the meantime, I might jump straight into welcoming uh, Eva Rodriguez Rodriguez, who is the Projects and Strategy Manager, um, who's going to, from Frontier SI, works with Phil, who will talk to us about Digital Earth Australia's market research project and our engagement with industry. There are some questions coming through. We might wait till the end of Eva's presentation to get to those. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I just requested control. So there's a little bit of lag, so excuse me if slides are a bit slow that has been happening through the presentation. Um, I guess what I want to talk about um, today is really what are the next steps in, in moving from that first dis Digital Earth Australia industry strategy, engagement and labs, and what are, the, what are the next things that we're doing here? And the focus really is about micro research, but this is really about awareness which is one of the pillars that um, that we've seen before um, when um, okay I'm going to have to request um, access again okay great um, so we've seen this slide a few times these are the three areas uh, that were identified as, as uh, key focus for um, DEA to be able to work with industry better and for industry to be, make better use of earth observation data and to gain better access to what DEA offers, which is not just the data, it's also the underlying infrastructure, the open data cube in which it's, it sits and, uh, and all of the analytical capabilities that, uh, that the program has, has developed and utilizes. Um, what we saw was that, so this next piece of work really is about the awareness um, component as we see here on the right hand side and what we're doing here is really to deliver on that and to do that we are actually engaging with a number of selected um, sectors and industries in Australia here and, and we're doing that we're actually um, not only um, engaging and creating awareness but also through the, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, through the mechanisms that we're utilizing, we're also providing education and training because we're doing a lot of hands-on work um, in the way in which we try to reach those new sectors that are not necessarily, or that have not necessarily been exposed to Earth observation before. So the challenge that we have here, and we identified a number of barriers when we looked at the DEA industry strategy, and there, there's a few documents that, uh, that kind of summarize those in Frontier SI website on the DEA um, dedicated side if you're interested to read a bit more in detail. But one of the things that we see is that um, communicating value, particularly when it comes to earth observation um, and DEA in this particular case, is often a challenge. Um, and this is because earth observation is traditionally coming from a very technical, scientifically focused domain. And so when we go to talk to users about it, we talk about how great it is and the great algorithms and products that we have, but people really fail to grasp, what does this mean for me? Um, and the responsibility for this really lies with technology providers or services, people, people that provide services such as um, civil labs we saw before and other companies. And there's a trend that is changing, but certainly even those companies said that Sometimes it's very difficult. Um, connected to this is also trust. Users, um, if they're gonna invest on earth observation or on a service that is based on earth observation, they want to understand that they're paying for something that they can trust. And so being able to really, um, I guess, create that connection and to show that what they are seeing on screen is representative of what's happening in the real life is really important. It's even more challenging when we go to industries where Earth observation is not known, and particularly for typically spatial businesses or geospatial businesses that are working on this domain, um, to move into new sectors can be a little bit scary and a little bit hard to tap on. 
So how do we go about changing these, creating this awareness and, and in a way um, allowing a new translation exercise where, where users and providers can communicate in a better way? Um, there was a question before around how do we engage with users? How do we make sure that users get the products and, and the information that they need? So this is about um, focusing on communication as a first step, making sure that we're all speaking the same language. Um, and the way in which uh, this follow-on work is, um, is structured is really about providing a very deep engagement with industries and sectors. And through there, we'll deliver um, a set of specific insights and reports that allow us to really understand what are, the what are those industries, who are their users, um, how are they currently using Earth Observation, or what is their expectation of Earth Observation. Sometimes there's a big mismatch between what Earth Observation can do and what it is people expect it to do. Um, we're creating user profiles, so trying to understand what do users do in their day to day, how do they actually go about their business, what are the kinds of things that interest them and what are the problems that they need to solve. And very, very important here is to understand um, what user needs in the language of their key problems, not in the language of my super exciting technological solution. We're focusing on five markets, which were identified as, as key um, initial markets during the um, industry. Engagement and consultation, agriculture, mining, financial services, infrastructure, and urban planning. And we're delivering um, this awareness work through re a really iterative engagement with those three market sectors and with targeted activities such as user interviews, collaborative workshops, having conferences on the matter, providing webinars, partnerships, and then through all of that, um, embed education and training as well. Um, when we go about engaging with the sector, and we've already performed the first sort of engagement with agriculture, and we're working with, um, with mining at the moment, um, we make sure that it's, as, as we create awareness, as we show what's possible, that, that users and others also can have hands-on activities so that they go home and they have, they know where to go to collect data, they know how to play, they know how to, what are the next steps for them to, to receive and, and I guess to, to better understand how they can interact um, with the data and with Earth observation. Okay, so just to some additional comments on some of the statements that, that I may have said and that you may see if you go and have a look at the reports. Um, we're really generalizing here on what we hear that happens across industry. Um, not all companies are getting in wrong. In fact, we're seeing amazing work being done by um, some of the DEA labs companies and others here in Australia and globally. And, and this is what we want to do. We want to showcase and highlight um, the companies and industries that are getting it right and how they're actually being able to connect to users and to deliver extremely exciting services and solutions that are actually being used and useful um, in those markets. What we're really focusing here is in trying to understand um, and to deliver in what industry asks for. So this market awareness um, sort of exercise is really responding to what the private sector here in Australia said was needed to really grow the utilization of Earth Observation in Australia, and in particular to do that through the EA, which is a phenomenal platform um, and a playground for, for these companies and users to start to, to use that data and services. We've got um, some of the first results coming soon on the agriculture exercise that we've just undertaken through a report that will be published over the next month. Um, but again, just to stress out that this is just the beginning of the conversation um, for, for successful connection to users and for successful development um, within, deeply within these sectors. Um, we need to create connections in an ecosystem that's maintained and that's alive. Um, and so this report will present some of the ideas that industry then can take and, and act on. But through that and through the engagement, we'll continue to have conversations and engagement with users and with the industry in this particular area and on the other sectors that I've explained, that I've showcased before. And I guess uh, the last one is about how you can help. So I presume we've got a mix of different people here online, um, maybe some users, maybe some technical providers, maybe some people that are just interested overall. Um, I guess what's needed is, is a number of things. So on the one hand, industry contacts, 
for us to continue our interviews and workshops. We really tap on thick bodies um, and then we go from there and we've got a very extensive network of users and through them we can expand the networks. The more people we can reach out, the better. Um, if you're a company and are doing great work on a particular area, the ones that we mentioned or others, try to reach out and understand what are the use cases that you have, things that we can demonstrate to customers so that they start to see what's possible. Um, try to change the conversation that you have with customers. So um, there's a lot of fatigue that we see in end users and, and I guess lack of credibility, unfortunately, when it comes to earth observation in some areas because they've been burned in the past, because people have tried to sell them things that weren't doing what they were meant to do. So perhaps it's about focusing on understanding what is your problem and deeply understanding that problem and then go home and make those connections and understand what are the solutions the potential things that you have that you may develop to help them. Um, and just join workshops um, that we'll be running to, to improve industry building activities and, and feel free to connect with us. Thank you. Thanks, Emma, that's fantastic. Um, we might move on to some questions now. If anybody has any questions for Eva, please chuck them in the chat window um, at the moment and we might jump back one um, and I'll ask Trent to answer that question. Trent, if you could answer, does the DEA Labs funding to the industry partners provide them with exclusive rights to the project IP? Great, thanks Alicia. Um, so, so the short answer to that question is absolutely all, all IP uh, that the um, successful applicants produced through their projects uh, still belongs to them. Um, for us, this is, this is about a learning experience. Um, this is about understanding um, how to bridge the gap between the, uh, the incredibly um, valuable data sets that we hold in Geoscience Australia uh, and end users at the other end. And, and there is so much work and frankly, so much IP that needs to be produced through this process. So we take an approach where we make uh, uh, as, as much of um, the code, um, the, the data, everything that we produce, we, we go out of our way to make that open and available. Um, and, um, and we certainly have no interest in, uh, in trying to, uh, to do anything um, that puts a barrier up for people creating great new IP. Um, so um, in terms of moving forward, Phil, Phil pretty much alluded to this, but there will absolutely be um, uh, future rounds of DEA labs. Uh, we're working through what they will look like. Um, but, but one thing that I can tell you, uh, I stand behind 100% is that we don't want to own your IP. Um, we want to grow uh, grow your business. We want to help you grow your business. That is our goal. So, uh, so we will we will never never actively try and do something that stands in the way of that. Thanks, Trent. Um, and thank you again to Phil and Eva for their presentations. We're doing some amazing work uh, with Frontier SI, and I can't wait to see what the future holds there. Um, please keep your questions coming in via the chat window. Thank you to the people that are answering them as they pop up. Um, and we might move along to our, our next and final speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our very own Rani Austin, who's going to give our guests some insight into the way the Digital Earth Australia program plans for the delivery of the program in the future. Thank you, Rani, take it away. Rani, do we have you online? Maybe on mute. We may, we may have lost Rani. So I might ask that our program director, Trent, sick of seeing him. Um, but Trent will take over and give the next presentation. Thank you. Um, but Trent will take over and give the next presentation. Thank you, Trent. All right. Can you hear me? 
That is good. Um, so, sorry, I am half familiar with some of these slides, but I will say is that, um, oh my goodness, this is not working. We're having some network issues. So, so what I'll do is I'll um, talk through what we, we did. Um, and that is that we have in excess of 70 people all working together um, on, on a couple of programs, Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa. Um, and we, go, we are an agile program and we go through a series of routine rituals where we are making sure that we're all on the same page um, in terms of the work that we're doing. We wanna be as aligned and autonomous as we can possibly be all working towards the same objectives. So every three months, there's a, a really key um, thing that we do, we call it a program increment plan. Uh, this is all based on um, the scaled agile framework or SAFE. Um, so if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, you can, uh, you can uh, Google it, you'll find some, some interesting information. Um, We've always uh, you know, had a reasonably good online collaboration um, culture where we're using things like Jira and Slack and um, Twitter and everything else in order to do um, some uh, useful, uh, useful collaboration with, uh, with staff within the building and also beyond. Um, uh, it's worth mentioning that, that you know, obviously we've been talking here about the collaborations that we have with our, with our labs partners, with Frontier SI, we work closely with CSIRO and, and the list goes on. There are so many other people that we work with. So we, we are reasonably used to this, but in terms of trying to have a single picture where we could all see together um, what on earth is going to be going on uh, across the entire program for the next three months. Uh, we really wanted to try and have, have something that, that pulled us together where we could, despite being in a position thanks to COVID-19 where we can't be in the same place, where we can still work together, um, we can still talk about things, we can still collaborate and, and um, I guess try and maintain as much of the essence of a crazy day of, of, um, of planning uh, as we have in the past. Um, so key to this was actually the use of a tool called Miro. Um, and Miro is, a, is, a, is basically a, an online whiteboarding tool, but literally we were in a position where we could um, There we go. So here is a here is a picture of Miro, where where we could all be uh, looking at one another's planning boards, putting sticky notes on boards, um, chatting with one another, and doing all of these things in real time. Um, the power of this tool in terms of driving conversation forward and and allowing people, despite being in different locations and being in a position um, where. Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, you know, we've been working at different times in order to, you know, in my case at least, uh, facilitate some homeschooling. Um, but, uh, you know, people have been working at different times. So when they were ready to come in and look at things, they could come in and they could see where the other teams were up to. Um, and it, it proved to be just a remarkable tool for us to work together um, in a free flowing way where, uh, you know, here, here's a mind map uh, of how we might be able to go about cultural improvement um, as, as well, you know, where we could uh, drive collaboration and talk about things that mattered to us in terms of making sure um, that we're driving ourselves towards being a better program uh, moving forward. So, so this, this, was broadly a success. I, I will tell you right now, we were exhausted by the end of the week, um, but it's been such a rewarding experience to, to know um, that there are these tools here that can help us. And I think really moving forward, um, there's gonna be some real advantages in trying to maintain some of the things that we have put in place in response to COVID-19 that are gonna make us, make us more productive um, and more effective communicators beyond COVID-19 as well. Um, so I seem to have lost the ability to uh, to move through slides. Is it back? It's there. Okay, it's back again. So apologies for uh, for that um, uh, impromptu presentation. But we really wanted to share the way that we we've gone about doing this because we know that this has been a struggle for so many um, so many companies out there, so many other organisations out there. So we wanted to share, uh, for better or worse, what we did um, and. 
uh, make sure that uh, you know we are we are driving conversations of, about how we work together uh, and how we work collaboratively um, as openly as we can. So I might leave it there and take any questions if there happen to be any. Thanks, Trent. That was fantastic. And I can uh, vouch for the fact that we were all very, very exhausted. Um, <laughs> we have a, a question from Trevor in the in the comments field. In a post-COVID world, do you think we'll keep the same processes? Look, um, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, pulling these things together, it's something that we've learned. So in, in DEA, we do actually have some uh, people who work remotely uh, routinely quite a bit. We have people who are based in uh, Europe, in China. We have people based in Tasmania. Um, we had people in, um, in um, central New South Wales. Um, and to be honest, we've reflected on this and, and many of these things that we've put in place to make life easier for us actually would have made life easier for those people uh, a long time ago. And so it's been a really important reflection process for us in how we, how we do uh, be as, as inclusive as we possibly can um, as, we, uh, as we move forward and we go through a process of, um, uh, of going going back to normal, I think we are we are absolutely learning some big lessons and and reflecting on on the pre COVID world uh, in terms of uh, how we're going to do things in a post COVID world. Um, I see another question here from uh, Emma: uh, What does servant leadership mean in an agile context? Is it matrix like matrix management? So no, it certainly isn't. So um, this is uh, I, this is a little bit of buzzword bingo. Um, but in terms of servant leadership, what this is about is really that concept that I spoke about at the start, where we want everyone to be as aligned as they possibly can be. And what we get out of everyone being aligned is that they're in a position where they can be incredibly autonomous. So the last thing that I would want is to be the only one in DEA who's able to go out and engage with the agriculture sector, for example. I want everybody to be going out and, and engaging with, uh, with people like the agriculture sector. So, so in terms of servant leadership, it really is about um, uh, starting from the top and making sure that we're driving a culture where people, people understand the bigger picture, people understand where their work fits in, and they can go out and they can meaningfully do, uh, do work that feels right to them, and that work is actually the right thing. And I don't need to do anything. As a, as a director in order to make that happen, other than to, to make sure that we have a culture where we are all pointing in the same direction. And that is, that is something, to be honest, I'm extremely passionate about, um, but it really is um, a, an absolute crux to us um, uh, being as productive and effective in, in engaging with the likes of you as, as we possibly can be. Thank you, Trent. Um, and it doesn't look like there's any more questions coming through. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our very first online Digital Earth Australia public showcase. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And I thank you very much for joining us via Zoom today. We'd really appreciate your feedback. This is the first time that we have done this online and we'd really love for you to engage with us further. So if you have any comments on the showcase or you'd like to receive further information or even the link to the recording, uh, please reach out to us uh, using the details, as I said, in your Eventbrite email, um, and we will get back to you. I'd particularly like to thank our five presenters today, especially our guests from Frontier SI, Eva Rodriguez, Rodriguez and Phil Delaney, and uh, Phil Tickle from SIBO Lab. So please give them a virtual and quiet round of applause. Um, and finally, we thank you all for joining us here today and we look forward to welcoming you to our next public showcase in August. Farewell, everyone.